All right, thank you very much, Father Bema, and welcome to everybody. It's uh, my great privilege and joy to welcome you all to the University of St. Mary Lake, Mundelein Seminary, for this 2015 Albert Cardinal Meyer Lecture Series. The series is named for the fifth Archbishop of Chicago and the second Cardinal to be buried here on the seminary grounds. Cardinal Meyer, a graduate of the Pontifical Biblical Institute and former professor and rector in Milwaukee, was also one of the most important cardinal scholars at the Second Vatican Council. This Meyer Lecture Series is an endowed lectureship made possible by the generous gift of the late Father Andrew Greeley, an alumnus of the seminary from the class of 1954. Father Greeley's original intention was for a strong intellectual engagement of topics after the model of the Gifford Lectures at the University of Edinburgh. The Meyer Lectures, while they would focus on contemporary issues in theology and church, would also be interdisciplinary, drawing not only from theology, but also from literature, social sciences, and the arts. As with past Meyer Lectures, our lecturer will revise her talks into articles to be formally published by the University of St. Mary of the Lake, most likely in our journal Chicago Studies, and we hope in the future they'll be part of a book, a collection of the Meyer Lectures over the years. Very happy, too, to welcome the members of the various components of the University of St. Mary of the Lake. In addition to all of our seminarians, I want to welcome our graduate and postgraduate students, students from the Pontifical Faculty, the Liturgical Institute, the Institute for Lay Formation, also people from the Institutes of Diaconal Studies, both students and staff, Ongoing Formation, and Instituto de Liderazgo Pastoral. Welcome again to everybody, and please enjoy the program tonight and tomorrow, and take full advantage of what this campus has to offer. I hope you have a chance just to wander around the grounds a bit and take in the beauty of this place. And so at this point, without further ado, I want to turn the microphone back to Father Bema, who will formally introduce our 2015 Meyer Lecturer. Thanks. Sherry Waddell is the author of the best-selling book, Forming Intentional Disciples, The Path to Knowing and Following Jesus. In 1993, she created the Called and Gifted program, the first gifts discernment process designed specifically for Catholics, which is now used throughout the world. She co-founded the Catherine of Siena Institute in 1997 with Dominican Father Michael Sweeney to equip parishes to form lay apostles for their mission to the world. Sherry is currently leading CSI's international team of trainers and facilitators who have formed over 100,000 lay, religious, and ordained Catholics in over 130 dioceses in the art of evangelizing postmoderns, in gifts and vocational discernment, and in understanding the theology and mission of the laity. When Sherry is not hanging out in airports, she enjoys working in her Tuscan garden under the critical eyes of her twin cats, Cosmos and Damien. We're pleased to have Sherry Waddell as the Meyer lecturer for this year and she will now address us on her topic, Discipleship, Key to Fruitfulness. Sherry? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Father Bema, and of course, Father Barron, and all of you for the privilege of being here in this wonderful place in Mundelein, and having a chance to share a little of what we have been learning um, I, there's a couple things I need to share with you. Probably, f first of all, I'm sure this is clear, but I am not an academic. By background, I am a practitioner. And what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight is not just what I myself have experienced and seen and learned over the past um, 20 years of working in the formation of the laity and in evangelization, but especially what I'm learning from an entire global network of apostles, lay apostles, ordained apostles, religious apostles, 
who together are really grappling with what, how do you evangelize in the postmodern world in the 21st century and what is different about that. So I'm not, when I speak, I'm speaking, I'm drawing, I'm thinking of me as sort of the repository in many ways of this collective wisdom. And I need to make it clear we're all on a learning curve here. We're all pioneers. So I'm going to be sharing with you some of what we have learned in the three years since I turned the manuscript in, because we are constantly learning and clarifying our understanding of how people in our generation process this most critical issue of faith, of relationship with God, and its meaning for the whole of their lives. So, from that, now, about a year and a half ago, I was at an invitation-only national-level conference on evangelization. The sort of thing that before the book I would never have been invited to, but now all of a sudden I found myself there. And if I named some of the people who were there, you would recognize them. Okay, so I was a little in awe of the people I was with. But what was fascinating is two hours into the meeting, a man came up to me during a break and said to me, until I read your book last month, I did not know it was possible to have a personal relationship with God. Now, nobody, nobody just drifts into this gathering, right? You're all chosen there. This man was in full-time ministry forming clergy. I, I have to admit I was a little stunned. I did not expect that. I, I'm used to having those conversations as I travel, but not there. And so I, it took me a moment to recover, and then I said, just help, help me understand from your perspective why you think that is. Why someone in your position would not know you could have a personal relationship with God. And it was fascinating because this is a good guy. He is a highly committed, highly faithful, hard-working Catholic who clearly loves the church and cared about it. And he came from a hard-working, very faithful, very much a practicing Catholic family. He says, we just never talked about it. I literally did not know it was possible. Now, I've had five conversations like that in the last week as I've traveled. I now have these conversations with bishops, with seminarians, with priests, with seminary faculty, with lay leaders at all levels who come up to me one at a time and say, what is this relationship with God thing? What do you mean by that? And, and every single one of these people is highly, highly involved in leadership in some capacity, either at the parish or the diocesan level. That's why when people who've read the book say that first chapter was like so depressing, right? You know, that one with all the statistics, the one that made you, they say, I wanted to throw the book away. I threw it against a wall. I never hardly got to chapter two. I understand, okay? I, I learned in the early days when I was trying to, before I learned how to tell that particular part of the story, um, you know, people would throw things practically. I mean, they would get upset. They'd implode. They'd go into hysterics because they felt when I was sort of laying out for them the parameters of our situation as though I was attacking the church. But there's one statistic that not only floored me, frankly, but floored everyone that I've ever talked to. And it's this one. It's the only one I'm going to talk about tonight because I think it's the most relevant. And that is the Pew U.S. Religious Landscape Survey found that less than half of American Catholics, and these are the ones who hold on to the identity, not the ones who have jettisoned it. These are the ones who still think of themselves as Catholic. Less than half of them are certain you can have a personal relationship with God, which is why I'm having all these conversations. Now, years ago, I read 
and one of John Paul II's very first papal documents, evangelization, I mean, catechesis in our time, he said many Catholics are still without an explicit personal attachment to Jesus Christ. They only have the capacity, the capacity to believe placed within them by baptism and the presence of the Holy Spirit. When I first read this, I don't know if you've ever done this, but it was like, okay, I want to say, okay, Holy Father, we need to talk. So I want you to like come here right now because I want to understand what you're saying here. I was so stunned. I'd never read a Catholic document that made this distinction between the capacity to believe given to us in baptism and by the presence of the Holy Spirit and that explicit personal attachment to Jesus Christ. What on earth was the Pope talking about? Basically, what he was talking about was this. It took me years to uncover it. It is a very simple distinction that has been made, that is typically made in Latin, that often doesn't get translated into English and quite as clearly as it is in Latin. The difference between the virtue of faith and the act of faith. Now, I live in Colorado. I live in the Colorado Rockies, nearly 7,000 feet high. And every year, in the highest town in North America, in Leadville, Colorado, there is the race across the sky. Basically, people in their right minds, well, more or less in their right minds, run from 9,600 feet over the Continental Divide, 100 miles, and back again in 30 hours. It's the Leadville Trail 100. You have to finish. If you, don't, if you finish in 30 hours in one second, it doesn't count. It has to be within 30 hours. Every year, unbelievably, hundreds of people finish, men and women, people in their 60s routinely finish Leadville. Because it isn't about speed and youth, it's really about courage and mental toughness, discipline, and the power of community. But what's amazing about this race, I like to be there at the finish line. I like it because the drama of it, I mean, the truth is the Uber athletes, they finish in the middle of the night. Who cares about them? What's really interesting is the last hour because that's when normal people finish. People like you and me who are trying to do something they've never attempted in their lives. And the tradition is, as you get near the finish line, the last couple of hundred yards, you join hands with your family and your friends and your, all your team who got you that hundred miles, some of whom ran with their person for 50 miles not to compete. They ran with them to enable them to finish the race. And the tradition is you all join hands and you cross the finish line together. And I love to be that, uh, part of that crowd of a thousand right around the finish line. Now, I have friends who have run and finished the Leadville 100, but you'll notice I'm at the finish line. A, that's because I'm not crazy. And B, even though I have the potential to run the race, because I have two legs and they work, I have not been willing so far to do the year of training necessary to actually run the race. I have the capacity, but I have not made that personal, explicit personal choice. And that's what we're dealing with. Many, many, all of our validly baptized people have been given that capacity in evangelization, we are calling them to begin to run the race for which the power was given to them. And that is really the issue before us. Now, in our Making Disciples seminars, this is material that's not in the book, but we've used this as a very simple schema for years to help Catholic leaders wrestle with the idea of um, basically spiritual development in adults. Now, of course, I'm not using, this is not the traditional purgative, illuminative, unitive way. You know, that's an interior, that's about the interior journey. This is really much simpler than that. We've just found it very, very helpful to describe the early transitions that people make as they move to be become a disciple 
and then move, hopefully, to be an apostle, that is someone whom Christ is not, who's not only following Christ, but who is being sent by Christ. Now, this is, in the church's understanding, the seeker phase is what they would call the first conversion. The disciple phase is what is sometimes called the second conversion, the ongoing lifelong conversion of discipleship. Let me describe this a little bit more. I wrote Forming Intentional Disciples just about the seeker stage, that journey from all the way to maybe, I don't even believe there is a God, and if there is a God, why should I care? And it is a long journey for 21st century people to the point where I can say I am, have begun to follow Jesus Christ as his disciple in the midst of his church. It is that journey to intentional discipleship. That's what we mean by intentional, as in conscious. You, nobody runs the Leadville 100 in their sleep. You do it intentionally or you don't do it at all. That's what I mean by intentional. So this is a journey, and this is what I wrote the book about. In fact, the catechism calls this the first and fundamental con conversion, which is a very interesting phrase. So this is, this is the beginning place. Now, those of you who've read the book, I'm, I'm not going to have time to go into this in great detail, but one of the prime the things I spent four chapters on was trying to help us understand how postmodern 21st century people process the journey to discipleship. Because we do not process it the way our grandparents did. The culture has changed so much in the last 50 years. And so that this is really the discovery behind what, what I call the thresholds of pre-discipleship. The stages, these are thresholds of conversion. Every single one of these stages is a real work of grace. This is God at work to which every single one requires a personal yes. So every single one of them takes real spiritual energy to move through. And it's, it's a deeper and deeper yes. Trust, curiosity, openness, seeking, and intentional discipleship. Now notice, this is about where are you in your lived relationship with God? That question is what got us into evangelization. I've been doing gifts discernment work, discernment, helping people discern how they've been gifted by God for the sake of others for 20 years. But 10 years ago, I was listening to a woman leader in Canada who, wasn't, who was struggling basically to come up with any stories because that's part of the process. We listen to your stories of being used by God and we re help you recognize patterns in the story that may indicate the presence of a charism. She had no details in her stories and the Holy Spirit is in the details. So finally, in desperation, I wasn't getting anywhere, so I asked her a question I had never asked any person before, ever. I said, could you just briefly describe to me your lived relationship with God to this point in your life? She looked at me, you know, in a very business-like fashion, and then for about a moment, and then she said, well, I don't have a relationship with God. Now, this woman led a very large women's ministry, a diocesan women's ministry. She was president of this. She was head of that. My initial response was, no, that's impossible. Absolutely not. Now, honestly, see, I come, I'm not Catholic by background. I come from a planet that you hard, most of you have never even heard of. I'm the if there's a right, far right wing fringe edge of the fundamentalist world, go there and go another 10 miles out. And that's where I was raised, okay? So in a sense, for me to become a Catholic, it's like becoming a Martian. So my tendency and my fear because of my background was, my initial thought was, oh my goodness, I have projected my Protestant experience on her. I must have asked her the wrong question because clearly she would not be doing this without some kind of spiritual motivation. And honestly, and because I, at that point in my Catholic life, sort of, I was working on the presumption that the reason Catholics didn't talk about their faith was that because they were deep. No, 
I mean, really, right? Because silence is deep. Um, I was, of course, from the shallow, noisy end of the Christian pool, where they talked incessantly. But I presume because Catholics were somehow all participating in profound, the profound prayer of quiet, they didn't need to talk about it. And I thought I must have slipped and used Protestant language. That's why she couldn't answer my question. But I'm going to find it because I know it's there. There is no way she would be doing this without it. I spent the rest of that hour going at that from every conceivable angle I could think of. And at the end of the hour, I realized she'd been telling me the truth in the first place. I was just unwilling to hear it. As far as she was concerned, she could have been volunteering at any community organization, any nonprofit. There was no spiritual motivation as far as she was concerned. I came out of that interview. I went to my co-director and I said, that is the most amazing conversation I've ever had. Maybe we should start asking that question more often. And we started to ask the question on a regular basis. And it was stunning, the stuff that would roll out of people's mouths, leaders, heads of parish councils, and sort of things. So it began the journey that took us here to realize that many of our people who are good people, who are faithful people, who are active Catholics, may not yet be disciples. They may be at one of these earlier stages in terms of their lived relationship with God. This is not their sacramental status or whether they're active or inactive. Now, you may notice that after intentional discipleship, it says 5% of active. That is not a scientific figure. I'm, you will notice that a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you, I have footnotes for some things, but a lot of this is unfootnoted because it comes from what we're learning in the field. That figure came from a question we asked 1,600 parish and diocesan leaders who went through our Making Disciples seminars from 60 different dioceses over the years. About two days in, after discussing intentional discipleship for two days, I would turn to them and I would say, okay, here's my question. What percentage of your parishioners would you estimate are intentional disciples? And then we'd send them off into tables, pastors with all their staff and their leaders, you know, just to have them discuss. Honestly, we had no agendas. I just thought, my goodness, look at all the experience in this room, all that pastoral experience. I, we need to know what they know. You know, we're not in their parishes. We're not in their dices. What are they seeing? That, we had no idea what they would say. What stunned us was time after time after time, they would come back and they would estimate 5%. And think about it. This is 5% of the people they actually have contact with, which means it's 5% of those who are active, the ones who show up enough for you to have some sense of them, not the ones who never darken the door. So it's a loose figure. It's not scientific. There's no studies per se. But on the other hand, I don't feel free to blow off the feedback of 1,600 pastors, vicar generals, DREs, lay staff, diocesan staff, campus ministers, and say, well, you know, I don't know why you said that. What if it's even close? What if it's close enough for government work? What if it's single digit or somewhere there? It, it, Nevertheless, it's a very interesting, interesting response. If you think of this wide area as every human being on the planet, all 7.3 billion of us, Jesus Christ, we believe as Catholics, is the mystical center for the whole human race, for the whole cosmos. Whether people have heard of him or not, know of him or not, are Christian, have ever been baptized, have any access to baptism, he remains the center. Almost exactly one-third of the human race is baptized currently. And if that looks small, actually the interesting thing is that is the highest percentage in human history. Those scholars who look at this estimate that only about 36% of all the human beings who've lived in the last 2,000 years even had an opportunity to be baptized. So while we believe the sacramental economy is normative, 
It is not necessarily normal in terms of historic human experience. We've got one third of the human race is baptized. Christ is the center for all of us. And we all know, we all know there are many, many people who neither believe nor do they trust us. Anybody have someone like that in your life? Family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, children, grandchildren? Yes. As people move closer, as they begin the journey to Christ, whether they are baptized or not, the first threshold that typically people in the 21st century cross is trust. And that is not faith. I need to make that really clear. That is just some positive association with Christianity, with Christ, with the church, or maybe they don't believe in any of that, but they know you. They trust you. They think that religion thing you do is kind of weird. But they like you, okay? They trust you. You're the living bridge of trust. You're the door. There has to be, one of the things about evangelizing, if we encounter someone who has no trust, it's the first evangelizing task, is building the bridge of trust. Because that's what it's gonna be our job to do. And maybe just to become that bridge. They, if they do not have a positive association with something related to the faith, they will not move further. Now, some of us have mystical experiences. It isn't through a human being. I happen to be Catholic today because as a completely clueless undergrad in Seattle with a head full of the anti-Catholic mush that I was raised in, because I was certain that St. Clair's Church, two doors down the road, was the anti-room of hell. Okay, so, so I, that was still running around in my head. I, I had gone through a conversion as an undergrad. I was looking for a place to pray during the day. Protestant churches are closed. Catholic churches are open. I didn't know why. I walked across the threshold and I felt the real presence of Christ. Though the church was named Blessed Sacrament. If you had told me what that meant, I would not have believed you. Because, you know, that was contrary to all the categories I had in my head. But in one fell swoop, God established a bridge of trust for me. That is why, ultimately, I am Catholic today. There has to be a bridge. Now, as people move further in, curiosity. Curiosity is not discipleship. It is not personal faith yet. It is casual curiosity. It's like casual dating. You know, it's like, you, you're interesting. I was uh, actually on a, I, I have some wonderful plane stories. I was on a flight going into Manhattan. It was probably into, I guess, JFK. And we were just, uh, you could see Manhattan in the distance. And the, you know how it is, the person next to you suddenly decides to talk in the last 10 minutes of the flight. And he turned to me, he goes, you, what do you do? Now, it was very interesting. He was very, very New York. Do you know what I mean? Very New York in manner. And it was also clear that he was Jewish. So I thought, okay, now what am I going to say? How do I put this? So I said, well, I travel around the country and I help people learn how they've been gifted by God for the sake of others. He goes, you, you're interesting. <laughs> I am? Do I want to be interesting? You know, that's not good most of the time, right? You're thinking, okay. He says, so do you believe in this Jesus guy? Yeah, yeah. He says, uh, me, you, you may have figured out I'm Jewish. I said, mm, had, yes. He says, so, uh, like, why aren't you in Chicago, you know, or, or Houston or New York, big cities where you can really make some money with this? He says, so how much do you charge for this? Like, like $25,000? I snorted. I couldn't help it. I said, I'm Catholic. He says, oh, too bad. He knew what that was. <laughs> but you, you're interesting. That's casual curiosity. Only if we're making disciples, it isn't us that needs to be interesting. And oddly enough, it isn't primarily the church as such. We want them ultimately 
to be develop curiosity about Jesus, the center, the Lord, the Savior, the Bridegroom. How can we foster curiosity, more and more curiosity about Him? As people become more and more curious about Him, then the issue of openness comes up. Openness is a really critical threshold. Notice I've got these big, fat, broken lines because those represent defenses. It is hard for 21st century people to make this transition often. Because all you're doing, it's not a commitment, you are not a disciple, you're not signing on the dotted line, but it does involve declaring yourself open just to the possibility of change, just opening that door a tiny bit. But even doing that for most 21st century people is really hard because it does involve opening yourself to the unimaginable and something you do not control. And so a lot of people struggle with this transition. It's just acknowledging to God and to myself that I'm open to the possibility of change. And it's a huge transition. They need intercessory prayer. They really need our assistance as they are on the verge of openness. As people move further, they become more and more open. And then they sort of reach this level we call seeking. Seeking is dating with a purpose. It's not casual anymore. This is, are you the one? This is looking serious, like I'm going to have to make a decision. I have to make a commitment. Only, of course, they're grappling with the possibility of following Jesus as his disciple. We use the image, it was gospel reading about a month ago, of Jesus coming to Simon and Andrew on the Sea of Galilee. They're fishing. He says, come follow me. The scripture said they abandoned their nets and they followed him. People at seeking haven't abandoned their nets yet. They're still holding on to them, but they're thinking about it. It's the way you and I and some of us felt on the verge maybe of getting married, on the verge of becoming engaged, on the verge of entering seminary, on the verge of taking that leap. And you're contemplating something that could change your life forever. That's what it is. It's only here they are contemplating saying that, that profound, that personal yes to Christ, to follow him into who knows what. That's seeking. And then intentional discipleship. This is, we call it dropping your nets because it is what Simon and Andrew did. They abandoned their nets and they followed him. Obviously, did they know where this was gonna lead them? I mean, Simon didn't even know he was Peter yet, right? Much less think of Peter the way we think of Peter. They had no idea where this was gonna take them. They just knew this compelling man was standing in front of them saying, come follow me. And they began that journey. Are they saints? No, of course not. But have they begun the journey of discipleship that will ultimately lead to sanctity? Yes. Notice we have people who are disciples who have not yet been baptized. We also have people who are baptized and haven't moved in their lives. They don't even know there's a journey to make. And every variation, this is just my attempt to give you some idea, we're all in motion. Every one of us in this room is in motion because it's a real relationship. And that means you and I, could, our bodies could be here, but our heads could be somewhere else. We know from all the surveys that Catholics, a typical Catholic who is thinking about leaving the church, will be sitting in our pews for two years before they leave. You and I see them. We see the same, you know, Tom always, he's over there, always in that corner behind, behind the, you know, the um, column that hides him from Father, so Father can't see him, right? So he's always there at the 9.30 Mass every single Sunday. And we figure as long as we see him there, well, everything's fine. 
inside he's going how much longer can I do this are there alternatives what should I do a lot of our people are sitting amongst us wondering should I stay or should I go and there's people who like the classic revert over here. This is the revert journey. I went way out, left, you know, went way out. And now I'm on my way back in. There's, this is what we hope will happen in RCA. People will become disciples before they are baptized. That is, that is what the church outlines as ideal. Notice there's the person who came to the verge of openness but couldn't quite make the transition and is on their way out. There's the torture journey there and every variation thereof. We're all, this is living. This Sunday when you take a moment and just go find a hidden place in your sanctuary and turn and look at the congregation. Instead of presuming that we're all been Catholic all our lives and we will all be Catholic all our lives, what does it mean to look at us and say, where are you right now? In what direction are you moving right now? Toward Christ? Away from Him? Maybe you said, I'm tired, I'm sitting down, I'm not moving at all, or some variation thereof. That's, that's the reality of our life in the 21st century. Our culture has changed and it actually penalizes religious groups that depend upon inherited religious identity. And it rewards groups who actively evangelize. And this is true not just for Catholics, it's true for every religious group in the country. If those who depend upon inherited religious identity are hemorrhaging, Now, we don't want to confuse those early thresholds of trust, curiosity, and openness with discipleship or even serious seeking. These early thresholds, every one of them is important, every one of them is a work of grace, but they are still essentially on the passive end of the spectrum. In our experience, now as I said, we've worked with about 100,000 Catholics now, directly in many hundreds of parishes. And, and not, not just in breadth, but the fact that the, what our real learning curve has been is sitting down with people and really listening to them. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Catholics. So far in our experience, and this is just a loose estimate on my part, but our experience is the majority of Catholics, whether practicing or not, are in one of the earliest and most passive levels of spiritual development. The average practicing Catholic who shows up at least once a month is probably in trust or early curiosity in our experience. There are many exceptions and we work with some amazing parishes all over the place. And every parish has Saints, we have met people who are at the highest level of spiritual development. We have met genuine saints who are living the unitive way. So they're there everywhere. But generally speaking, the majority of our people are back at one of these earliest and most passive levels of spiritual development. And that fact has huge implications for our culture and our parishes, for our pastoral practice, and there's a lot of which I'll deal with tomorrow morning. But this is really important. Now, this is just another way to look at those thresholds. Notice, roughly 35% of American Catholics would be considered active, that is, they show up once a month. 65% aren't even on this, you know, they're not on this slide anywhere. They're over here somewhere. So when we talk about people at trust, curiosity, openness, and seeking, we're mostly talking about active people. If somebody is physically present in your parish, they're almost certainly at least at trust. If they had no trust, they would not be physically present. So we can more or less presume that if they're here. We can't presume beyond that, though. That's the issue. A lot of our people are down here in trust and maybe early curiosity. And pre-evangelization is intended to address the needs, the spiritual needs of people who are off this chart, who don't even trust us, 
and those who are at trust and in those very early stages of curiosity, that is, that is the, the part of evangelization that is designed to deal with these very early stages of development. Initial proclamation of the kerygma, or as Father Barron says, I love his term, the great story of Jesus. The, the story that is at the center of our faith that God became human in Jesus of Nazareth and his life and his teachings and his miracles and his relationships and his suffering, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, that drama, the core of the core of the core from which all of our doctrine and our worship, it, that's the center for all of it. That initial proclamation helps people move into curiosity, become more and more curious, become spiritually open to the possibility of change, and then move into seeking. And then initiatory catechesis comes into its own, right about the time people are seeking. In terms of RCAA, for those of you who are involved, typically actually enrolling people into the formal catechumenate is actually really well done when somebody's moving into seeking. Now catechesis is, they're gonna treat it totally differently because now it is addressing questions they actually have. Here's the reason I'm doing all this. And I've asked this question many times, I don't have, I won't be able to do it here, but many, many groups over the years where does roughly 90% of our time and energy go in the typical parish? It goes into catechesis or sacramental prep, liturgy, and the sacraments, right? The problem is 90% of our people are developmentally down here. 90% of our energy is going on up there. We, I understand totally, those of us who love the church's rich tradition and the history and the beauty and the art and the, the spiritual masters and the theology, and we want to share that. It is so beautiful and compelling for us. But we have to understand that in many ways we are attempting to teach college physics to preschoolers who do not read and write yet. And the gap between where most of our people are and where we spend our time is our problem. That's why the new evangelization is so critical for our generation, because it gives us, in a sense, the vision and a sense of what to do to help people move to the place where now catechesis becomes this powerful, transformative encounter. All right, now, moving along, let's talk about disciple. I've, I've dropped my nets, I've begun that journey. I am, I'm not mature, I'm not a saint. I could still, like Peter and Andrew, I'm still a mess, right? I am capable of doing all kinds of things, but at least I've begun the journey. This is what the church calls that second conversion. It is a lifelong transformation as we walk with Christ through life. And this is where catechesis comes into its own because it really, the church says, is intended for people who've made that initial commitment for the maturation and the integration of their faith in the whole of their life, helping them form those basic habits of discipleship, mentoring them. This is where people start to bear fruit. This is where, it's interesting, we're discovering one of the issues we deal with a lot is that so many of our people are intimidated by going public with their faith in a hostile or indifferent environment. What we're realizing is some of this is developmental, that literally people will not go public in a hostile environment until they've reached a certain level of maturity as a disciple. Not that they're a saint, not that they've got all this stuff resolved, but they, have their, their, they just have this sense of basic security rootedness in this identity, and it gives them the courage 
to go public in hostile environments. When I became Catholic, I was working at the University of Washington. You know what my coworkers said to me? They said, gee, I thought you were intelligent. And of course, really what they meant was intelligent woman. They just didn't fill in the rest of it. Because I, I, I was working on a nursing unit where you practically had to be an ex-Catholic to be hired. Everybody there it seemed to have gone through 12 years of the Catholic school but me. And none of them practiced. To go public in that environment was not simple. And it's, it's going to take us. So the key to our people being really engaged effectively in witness and evangelization in the world, again, is helping them grow spiritually as disciples. And we've also found that the whole gifts discernment process, we call it the called and gifted. But basically, um, this is a process where we help people discern, recognize, these charisms, these ways that they have been supernaturally empowered to be instruments of God's love and mercy and beauty and truth and healing and provision for other people. They, it, this, the charisms come with baptism. They're part of the whole amazing package that we receive in baptism and confirmation. But they typically, these gifts do not manifest until the point when you start to follow Jesus. Usually they don't, they, unless you're at least at seeking or in early discipleship, the gifts they're there, present. They're like seeds underground in winter in Colorado. Seeds underground in winter in Colorado, and I speak as a gardener, they look dead. But they're not. These gifts lie fallow in our lives until we give that personal, we give that first personal act of trust. We, we begin the journey, and then they start to show up in our lives. So all of this, and it's, it's helping the people discern that. It, on our, it's really been amazing. It helps Catholics not only understand themselves as someone who's following Jesus, but as someone who is sent by Jesus. And this is such a huge turning point for the average Catholic. One woman said to me, she said, I used to think I was not worthy to kiss the sandals of Jesus. And now you tell me that I put them on and I walk like they fit that I stand in his place with my daughter and with my family and with my friends. She said, this is revolutionary. This is a totally different universe. So that transition, parishes that make disciples see much fruit. Disciples attend mass. I know this sounds incredible. But seriously, they do. They serve. Disciples will move into leadership all over your parishes. We watch this all the time. Why? Because they care passionately about the life of the church. Disciples will fill every class in your parish, in your diocese, because they're hungry to grow. They will clamor to discern personal vocation, personal call. The charisms start manifesting. They are dying. They will go to great lengths to pass their faith on to their children. They take risks for the kingdom of God. They care about the poor. They give. Parishes that make disciples, giving always goes up. In fact, so often they say to me, we have the highest per capita giving in the diocese. It's gotten to the point where I hear that and I just go, okay, check. Just another parish growing and giving in discipleship. And this is, not, this is not out of guilt. This is that river of living water that Jesus was talking about to the woman on the well that will pour from with, that will rush out from within her. And all these things. It has all the things you and I desperately want to see happen. Attendance, stewardship, vocations, priestly vocations, religious vocations, great lay apostles who bring Christ to the world and do amazing things, you know, passing the faith on to our children, you name it. If you want priests, make disciples. 
If you want religious, make disciples. If you want lay apostles who will go out and evangelize the culture and the structures of the world, who will take the ch social justice teaching of the church and apply it in creative ways out there, make disciples. Because it is the fruit emerges out of that encounter. The whole apostle stage, now I have a sense that I have some responsibility for the mission of the church and that Christ is sending me. I am attempting to discern this. This is what, of course, Pope Francis is referring to as missionary disciples. Exactly the same thing. What is fascinating, this is the developmental stage at which people discern vocation. Now, I've had a lot of conversations with vocation directors over the years. In the early days, I would ask them, I'd say, what percentage of the guys you have discerning a call, possible call to priesthood are disciples? The first man I ever asked that, he said, none. I said, you want to, like, unpack that for me just a little bit? He said, well, nobody's ever talked to them about it. Now, the good news is, when I ask vocation directors now, most of them, almost all of them say, the majority, because we're very aware of that, we're taking great steps, uh, steps to address this, to call them to that encounter, to call them to that yes. But one man said something to me that was really stunning. He had his book, my book, was sitting there on the table between us. He said, yes, I would say the majority of our men are disciples, but he said, not a single one of them knows how to help anybody else become a disciple. Those of us who are in leadership, and I'm guessing there's nobody, let's face it, there's nobody, no casual Catholics here in this room, okay? You're the hardest of the hardcore, I know that. It is, it, every one of us, of course, has to make our own journey of discipleship. But the evidence, ultimate evidence, that your vocation, your ministry, your office is bearing fruit, ultimately, is the emergence of new disciples and apostles around you. Not so much, we are great institution builders, and yes, most of us spend most of our time sustaining institutions of some kind, running them, keeping the bills paid, keeping people running through them, yes. But that isn't the ultimate purpose for which we labor. In the end, if we call people to discipleship, they will take care of our institutions. They will sustain them, they will pay for them, and frankly, they will do things that we haven't even dreamed of because the power of the Holy Spirit will pour through them in creative ways that go beyond anything you or I would ever think of in a million years. The problem here, this is again, there's no studies on this, this is just Sherry talking. Based on our experience to this point, I would estimate that only about 1% of all baptized Catholics reach this level of spiritual development. And that is our vocation problem. We have 1.229 billion Catholics, one out of every six human beings on this planet is Catholic. There is no such thing as a vocational unemployment for Catholics, did you know that? Every single baptized person was anointed for a mission. It's part of what we receive at baptism. But most of our people, the vast majority, never reach this developmental stage at which you begin to seriously discern that. And this is also the stage at which creative, effective lay apostles go out into the marketplace and really start to shape the culture which is an incredibly sophisticated, complex, demanding, and a whole, it really takes your whole life to acquire the skill and the cr street cred and the authority to have that impact. This is the level at which it happens. 
I would roughly estimate, again, this is just based on our work, that only about nine, that only about two percent of all the charisms we have been given are being manifested and only about one percent of all the vocations we have been given are being manifested. Not because we don't have them, but because most of our people never get here. It doesn't take much. What's so amazing, in the right environment with a really thoughtful, intentional, supportive community, a person can move from seeker to disciple to apostle in one to two years. It is not that long a journey. I was talking this over with the rector of another seminary, which shall be nameless, um, just the other day, because I was speaking at his um, diocese. And we were talking about this, and we both said, I had said two years because I was being polite. He says, but, you know, the truth is it could be done in one. I said, I know. Sure. Are they, are they saints? No. That's not what we're talking about. But have they at least at an early stage taken on this personal sense of responsibility for the mission of Christ and for the well-being of his church. Even if they haven't been able to discern their particular call yet, but at least they're wrestling with that. They've moved into that world. With the right support around them, people can do this in one to two years. We need to be evangelizing with the end in mind. The two ends, the immortals created for perfect happiness with God and the apostle in their particular sphere at the height of their fruitfulness and their impact. We have tended most of the time, most of our energy understandably has gone into children. But we don't think when we labor with the children and how important that is, we are not primarily thinking of them in terms of their future vocation as an adult. Most of us would only have seen the teenage Agnes Ganja. We would not have seen this. And nobody in Mother Teresa's life did either. Her family did not know she was Teresa. Her fellow sisters did not know she was Teresa. Her bishop when she first went to him, saying, I feel I am called to found this, the Missionaries of Charity, he said, I knew that woman when she was a novice. I could not trust her to light the candles on the altar. She is not capable of this. That Agnes was Teresa was a mystery, like all vocations, that was hidden, and the one who knew was Christ himself. It's a mystery that is revealed as we walk with him, who we, he intends us to be. I love Hans Urban von Balthasar. He said, Simon the fisherman before his meeting with Christ, however thoroughly he might have searched within himself, could not possibly have found a trace of Peter. He could have rooted around in his unconscious his whole life and never come up with Peter. Agnes did not know she was Teresa. Simon did not know he was Peter. And you and I, many of us, and many of the people we know who basically won't darken the door of the church, who will walk away from us, who would cross the street to get away from us, they don't know yet who they were destined to be. Because that will be revealed as they encounter and walk with him. And that is what we help people do when we evangelize. The same pattern is not just true of individuals, also it's true of the spiritual, this is spiritual culture of a typical parish. Very briefly, in our experience, the average diocesan parish not associated with any special renewal movement, you know what I mean, or a religious order, or there's many special parishes that have really remarkable qualities. But I just mean this is a standard middle of the road ordinary diocesan parish. In our experience, the typical parish cultural norm that is the unspoken norm of what we are comfortable with as normal. And you know how you figure out what normal is? Violate it, right? 
And then everybody, you hear the gasp, people get that face, you know, they do that thing. And they, they get quiet and they get silent and they, they you know, and you go, uh-oh, I just said something wrong. I broke some unspoken rule. The typical cultural norm of an average parish in our experience is at the earliest and most passive level of pre-discipleship, really a trust. The cultural norm of a typical evangelical congregation is not, believe me, they are not saints, okay? I grew up in that world, those are my people. I saw them at their very best and at their very worst. But they do know this initial conversation needs to happen, which is why half of Catholics who leave the church end up in the Protestant world. Half become nothing, half become Protestant in the US, okay? And the half who become Protestant are the ones who will typically say, my spiritual needs weren't being met in the Catholic Church. They're the ones who leave us, not because their faith is diminishing, but because it is growing. However, we've worked with parishes whose spiritual norm is so far beyond that. I wrote about this in the book, but Christ the King in Ann Arbor was so fascinating. Um, I spent three days there three years ago. They had, this is a parish of 900 families, which is relatively small by American standards. They had 30 guys already ordained priests, including one who was ordained a bishop. They had 20 more guys in seminary when I was there. Their teenage, seven, their seniors in high school were already thinking about seminary. They had their own homegrown community of sisters, their own homegrown community of brothers. They have amazing lay apostles who are operating on a global scale. They started most of the social justice outreach in their area. And they have an amazing giving, I mean, just generosity in the parish. And it was a true story. There was an African bishop that uh, was visiting and the pastor said, why don't you preach to us? They have two masses on Sunday, come, you know, give the homily. The bishop explained to the pastor the night before, he said, I have a problem in that my cathedral has burned down. I need $65,000 to rebuild. And of course, to us, that's an expensive car. To him, it was a cathedral in his part of Africa. So the pastor said, hey, tell you what, why don't you preach? Tell us your need and we'll take up an offering on Sunday. And that's what he did. They took up an offering and the pastor stood up at both of the masses and said, here's what I'd like to propose. If we do not give the bishop enough to go back and build his cathedral, would you be willing for me to take money out of our rainy day fund to make up the deficit? And they took a vote on the spot. It was unanimous. The bishop went back with $65,000, rebuilt his cathedral. I have seen it online. The rainy day fund was repaid in two weeks. And you know what? All the way through this visit, I kept saying, is that, do you do know that's not normal, right? I'm like, <laughs> I mean, really, is that normal? They go, uh, they kind of look at me, they give me this funny look, they go, well, yeah, yeah, it's normal. No, no, you don't understand. Is that normal here? Yeah, yeah. It's normal when the majority of people are intentional disciples and the culture is one, the norm is one of mature discipleship. The fruit is stunning. In a sense, you and I have accepted, a re we have accepted things that are not normal, that are not supposed to be normal. Because we're intended to bear fruit, and especially together, of course, as individuals, but together. And I know you all know this. This is Pope Paul VI. I love this. Evangelization is the essential mission, the grace and vocation proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize. If this is what we exist to do, and especially when we understand what is at stake and whether we do it or not, then we have to make it the first thing. What is at stake? The eternal happiness of every human being. Because that's what we're destined for. That's what we were created for. That's why St. Thomas says, what will ultimately make me happy is the first moral question. Because that is the end for which we were created. 
the complete fruition of the whole sacramental economy. Every single sacrament, every single liturgy is supposed to be bearing fruit. And I'll, I'll get into that in detail tomorrow morning. But there are people out there right now, whole, whole communities, whole cities, who are waiting for what you and I have been given to give. And their life hangs in the balance. And it's not magic. You and I have to say yes. But we have been, we are the ones God has prepared. We're the ones God has gifted. In his economy, we are the one. And it matters that we say yes as individuals. It matters enormously that we say yes together. The next generation of leaders, of saints, of apostles, will emerge out of disciples that rise, that rise up around you and me. That's where leadership comes from. That's where creativity comes from. And the fulfillment of the church's mission on earth, the whole drama of subjective redemption, which subjective redemption just refers, it does, it does not say you and I are adding anything to what Jesus himself did through his incarnation, his life, his suffering, his death, his resurrection. That is what the church talks about as objective redemption. We don't add anything to that. But the how the grace he has won for us enters this world is made accessible to that person over there and this woman over there and this situation here. That is the drama that you and I as the church all participate in. It's called subjective redemption. How does that which Christ died to gain for us reach us? And he has, for reasons we do not understand, he has chosen to enter for it to reach the world through us. I love C.S. Lewis. I love the weight of glory. I quoted it at every single called and gifted workshop I've ever taught, but not this part. This is the part, but I especially love this one. He spends the whole of this, this is a homily he gave in the middle of World War II at our, the Church of Our Lady, the Virgin, in Oxford. And he says, He's, after he's talking about heaven and the glory for which every human being has been created, he says, it may be possible for each of us to think too much of his own potential glory thereafter, but it is hardly possible for him or her to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or the weight or the burden of my nature's glory, my neighbor's glory, should be laid daily on my back, a load so, so heavy that only humility can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken. That is what evangelization is. It is thinking deeply, caring deeply, praying deeply, and then carrying, laboring for the weight of my neighbor's glory. And that's what you and I, that is our essential identity in the church. And that's what I think we're being asked to say yes to now in our generation in a new way. But thank you very much.